is a very special treat in the classroom. We have Dr. Jill Fulte Taylor, and we're going to be talking about our brain, our brain. So I'm going to start the record button. Uh, and while I'm doing that and setting everything up while we're dancing and getting in the moment, I need for you guys to start tagging and texting and calling and let everybody know that there is a way, something they can do about their brain. They can learn about their brain. So let me go ahead and get the, the record started. Today, you're in for a treat. I am awestruck, really. I am awestruck because we have Jill Bolte Taylor, PhD. I, she, her book is called Stroke of Insight, but I think it's a stroke of genius. And so today, take a, lots of notes, get your pencils out and your paper because we're going to learn and grow together. So fasten your seatbelt. It's time to dance, get in the moment, and let's. Prepare to learn. Here we go. It's time to. The Lillian McDermott Show. We love, we fear. Bridges we burn. We make mistakes. Then we live and learn. When life gets tough. And it seems like your best ain't good enough. If you're in need of hope. I'll be, I'll be right here, right here. And when you need a friend, you can count on me. I'll be right here, right here waiting for you. This is the place you can always turn to when you need a friend. The Lillian McDermott Show. To reach out to Lillian, visit her on the web at whenyouneedafriend.com. Now let's all learn together. Here's Lillian McDermott. Hello, my listening and viewing friend. It's so nice we can meet each other on the air on this beautiful best day ever. And for those of you who are tuning into the classroom, please know I've been waiting for you. This is a safe place where you can go to when you need a friend. It is my commitment to provide alternative ways to heal, and it is my mission to make awareness, responsibility, and truth a part of our everyday life. And I hope you, my listening, as well as my viewing friend, will feel empowered to embrace a new truth and live the life of your dreams. Now we've all heard left brain thinker, right brain thinker, logic versus emotion. But today we're going to destroy some of these myths, you know, because I've been said, you're so emotional and you can't think when you're emotion, but emotional bull. We have the proof here that you can. And there's, there's so much evidence. And today we have Jill Bolte Taylor, a uh, PhD, who studied the brain many, many years ago because of the passion to understand her brother who had a mental illness. And because of that, she learned how the brain functioned and found herself in 1996, having a rare st uh, stroke, a hemorrhage on her left brain, which left her to be totally right brain thinking. And so can you imagine a scientist, a neuroanatomist uh, published, someone who understood the brain logically, all of a sudden being right brain. So she, Dr. Jill is here in the classroom to share her journey and also teach us how we can live with our whole brain, whole brain living. And since it is our sole purpose in life to give and receive love and knowledge, I am grateful that Dr. Jill Fulte Taylor is here to do just that. Welcome Dr. T uh, Jill, Dr. Taylor in the classroom. I didn't even ask you how you would like for me to address you. Princess Only Toad? <laughs> yeah, Queen Toad. Queen that Toad. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's, good to, it's good to be with you. Thank you, Lily. I appreciate your mission in, in using the classroom in order to help empower people to own their own power. So I'm really happy to be with you. Well, thank you. Thank you for saying yes to the invitation. So I would like for you to share a little bit about your background, uh, whether it's your um, education, but what led you to this moment and why you do what you do. Just 
quickly. <laughs> yes, I had uh, one of my brothers is only 18 months older than I. And I noticed as a little girl, because, you know, kids go together everywhere in a family. And I noticed that we would witness the exact same experience, but walk away with very different interpretations about what just happened. Uh, for example, uh, my brother and I might be playing in the front yard and a ball goes out near the street and we're playing near the street and mom comes out just yelling and screaming like a lunatic. And he believes that she's angry and I believe that she's terrified that we're going to get hurt. A completely sh different shift in how we interpret emotional content. So I became aware as a very young child about how our brains, how we as living beings can have completely different perceptions. And eventually my brother would be diagnosed with the brain disorder schizophrenia. So I became fascinated with how does our brain create our perception of reality? Reality. So I grew up to study the brain at the cellular level. So I'm a neuroanatomist. I think in terms of cells, cellular links in networks and circuits, and which cells are performing which uh, actions. And, and then, you know, the irony that I'm teaching and performing research at Harvard Medical School. And at the age of 37, I wake up one day and boom, I have a major hemorrhage in the left hemisphere of my own brain. And over the course of four hours, I would watch my brain deteriorate circuit by circuit, ability by ability. And so I shifted completely into the consciousness of my right hemisphere. I sat in absolute silence with zero language because that loop is uh, an action of the left brain. And two and a half weeks later, I went in and had surgery. They removed a blood clot the size of a golf ball, took that pressure off the brain. And I continued to sit in absolute silence for another two and a half weeks. And then I started hearing like the little radio channel, <laughs> and maybe parts of words and the language started to come back online. So it was a profound experience through the eyes of a scientist who thinks in terms of these cellular circuits to watch first the morning of the stroke where everything goes off circuit by circuit and then to, to go through that process of rehabilitation, purposeful re rehabilitation over the course of eight years in order to regain all function. You know, when I hear when I heard your story back in 2014, I mean, this happened a long time. You did your TED talk that exploded and crossed barriers, and probably you gave TED talk their name. I mean, there you you put them on the map. That's what I'm. That's my perspective. Yeah. But when you when you're when you're seeing how you had this miraculous recovery, I wonder why is it that some people have a stroke and never recuperate. What kind of hope can you share that you discover during this time that people may need to look into? Well, I think it's really important to realize that every stroke is different. You know, there's two types of stroke. A blood clot will get thrown off somewhere in the body. It'll travel in an artery until that, that artery tapers so small that the blood clot is too big and it gets stuck. And then all the tissue that usually gets the oxygen through that blood vessel, that tissue becomes compromised. And so that's one form. The other is if that, for some reason, that blood vessel explodes and then blood goes out into the space between the neurons and neurons are actually uh, allergic to, to blood. So when it comes in contact with it, it can, can paralyze or kill neurons. So every stroke is going to be different because the brain is really a very big place. There's uh, some 800 billion neurons, multiply that by 10 and you have, you have all the number of little support cells that are in there, lots of cells in there. So, so the trauma is gonna happen and then it depends on what was the job of those cells and depending on where, because your brain is organized very similarly to mine, it becomes predictable that if someone has a hemorrhage in the same place I had a hemorrhage, then they're probably going to wipe out the same cells that perform a similar function. So the mm. brain is organized probably about as well as we think of as our body being organized. So, so first it depends on where and the trauma and did the trauma kill those cells or did it traumatize those cells? And over time, can we regain rehooking those those cells back into the bigger 
functional construct of the other cells. And the brain will, when it's in a learning mode, it can, it can learn, it can create 1.8 million synaptic connections per second. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a lot. In real time, we can actually watch a group of cells that have been traumatized and watch the other neurons literally reaching in, like people reaching in if there's a wounded person. We reach into them in order to bring them, draw them back out, back into health. So the brain is this amazing uh, uh, organ that is in constant time. It's constantly learning and changing and shifting. And so figuring out how to, what is the trauma? What is loss? And then what can we do in order to positively rehabilitate those specific functions? So, um, you know, there's always hope. As long as we're alive, the brain is capable of neuroplasticity. It's capable of learning and changing. So then it really becomes a matter of, I think, how do we strategize bringing those cells back into the network so that they can then reperform their function. So mental health and brain health is completely based on cellular health. So as you are rehabilitating for eight years, are you trying things that you never thought you'd try like frequency, um, music? I mean, what were some of the things that people can open the door to and start looking in to see if that could help them? Well, I think that, that, you know, um, you have to look at what, what is missing? What can, what could you do before that you can no longer do before? So let's say, uh, I lost my left hemisphere. My right par side went paralyzed for a while. And then it just became extremely weak called paresis. And so what I did in order to rehabilitate that was to walk and to walk with a push toward rhythmicity. First, I had to go to the process of being able to just roll over. I mean, I couldn't roll over because my brain wasn't recognizing that my shoulders were separate from my torso, separate from my pelvis so that I could twist enough to simply roll over. So, so everything, you know, if the goal is to sit up, then I can't just say, okay, sit up and I can't sit up. So now I'm a failure, right? There's like 50 different steps to getting to sitting up and I have to be willing to to take it one tiny little celebration at a time. And neurons are not in a hurry. We humans, we're in a hurry. Well, neurons are not in a hurry. So we have to get the network to reconnect in order to reconnect, in order to reconnect, in order to be able to perform a, a, a complex movement. So I think it's really about working with, with someone who, who understands that we the goal is not to go back to, to, to uh, from A to Z, you've got to be willing to take these tiny steps in order to build up what it's going to take in order to get, you know, a kid, a, an infant doesn't come out of the womb walking, right? Correct. It's got a lot that's, of steps it's got to go through in order to figure out and to coordinate. Yes. And that's kind of what happened. I described the morning of the stroke as I became an infant in a woman's body. So then it was, you know, what, what is, what is the next thing I would naturally be able to do but can't do. And what is, is there an obstacle for me to achieve that? So, you know, rehabilitation is a very special, special subject. Well, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad maybe someday we can come back and, and you can come back and maybe share some of that rehabilitation story uh, for people that are looking for that kind of hope. And for those of us who we think we take our body for granted, maybe we can take note and say, I want to prevent this. And right. so, you know, I really do appreciate your, the, the fact, you know, it started off with your brother wanting to understand that, but because of that, you became so um, passionate about the brain and because of your experience, look at how you've been able to help so many people. Now, oh, I'm grateful. Oh, without I'm, a doubt. I'm grateful. I, I realized that I would not be the woman I am today if it were not for my relationship with my brother's illness. Awesome. That, you know, and that's a great yeah. lesson. I, I do a workshop and we talk a lot about going to the past. I call it visiting the tomb and mm -hmm. finding the resurrection. Yes. And so I, I, I think it's beautiful how your brother has served such a beautiful uh, place in your, in your heart and in your life yeah. and being able to um, accept and embrace what is today. Um, yes. So as you were finding peace in your life, 
and finding that you now you're in front of thousands, millions of people sharing your story of, of hope and how the brain and how we can choose who we want to be. Right. Did you get people saying that can't be, you know, once this happens, you know, the limitation of the, the brain, how were you able to explain the expansion of the brain and get people to understand? Well, I think that the, the proof is in the puppy. You know, that's always what I say. If you have a puppy who comes back with uh, bad uh, uh, blood problems, but the puppy is healthy, you got to, the proof is in the puppy. For some reason, the puppy's okay. And so, you know, I came from this major hemorrhage. Anybody can look at my scan and say, oh, yeah, I was not good. And look at the images of my surgery and say, ooh, I'm glad I wasn't that girl. Um, and I had nothing. I mean, I, I had become an infant in a woman's body. Um, I shifted completely out of the left brain abilities into the right brain. And, um, you know, my doctor, my neurologist said to me, Jill, your job now is to recover and we won't know anything for two years. So just go, go do what you need to do in order to, to heal yourself. And so she took all the pressure off of me. She didn't come to me and say, if you don't get it back in three months, forget it. You'll never get it back six months at the most, a year max. And she didn't say any of that. She said, uh, it's now your job to recover and go do what you can do for two years. And I did. And, and it was fantastic to not have that limitation coming from a medical professional. Because first of all, a medical professional is the medical expert, right? Well, expert is great in a Western medical world, but there's also an Eastern medical world. And the thing about the Eastern medical um, non-traditional stuff, stuff <clears throat> is that we can't measure it with the left brain uh, scientific method. And therefore we may not have as much respect for it because we can't measure it and duplicate it, which is the process of doing experimentation. So I didn't have any problem exploring other things that match the body systems, but simply didn't match in linearity of, of a left brain. Mm -hmm. So I just was out of the box. I did what I needed to do in order to take, figure it out. And I figured it out. And, you know, I'm the walking example that I'm the walking example, right? And so the TED talk uh, it, it was, that was the first Ted talk that ever went viral. So Ted and I exploded into the world together and, um, and it's been interesting because they, we know what Ted has done. They've grown into this amazing phenomenon. Uh, and, and I just kind of, what happened to Jill Bolte Taylor? And, <laughs> um, and, and so really what I did was I had to go in and figure out, I know what I did. I know through my, my, my vision and understanding of the brain and what I did, but how do I communicate to other people how to understand your brain so that you can embody each of the parts of your brain, which you think are unconscious because it's in a right brain. Well, well, and then whole brain living became the product of that thinking because I realized in our society, we think we have an, uh, the right brain's emotional, the left brain's rational thinking. Well, that's not true. They both have emotion and we have two amygdala and two hippocampi and two anterior cingulate gyri as part of that limbic emotional tissue. So the question really is what's, what's going on in the right brain versus the left brain? And the right brain is a right here, right now machine. And so it's the emotions of the present moment, which is very experiential. I'm having a lovely time. The temperature in the room is great. My clothes are comfortable on me. I got these glasses on my face. That's fine. You know, what, what is the experience of the present moment right here, right now? But the right here, right now isn't about me, the individual. The right here, right now is the collective energetic whole. We are one human family. I, I don't have the definition of me, Jill Bolte Taylor, which I, requires a left hemisphere for, then I'm just in the present moment. And right now is a perfect moment. And I say, hey, Lily, let's go do something fun, right? Let's go uh, explore in the creek bed and, and let's see if we can find some geodes and see if, you know, the snakes have gone to sleep yet. Yeah. And, you know, let's go explore, you know? <laughs> and then we have this right thinking neocortex, which is also of the present moment, but not as it's related to me. So the present moment exists and we can, it's an ongoing timetable that we can 
always tap in and out of. And then this left hemisphere comes online and it says, okay, well, that is great, but it's non-functional in the real world, right? Because the real world's filled with details. We need to be able to control and organize and rationalize and create a relationship between me and the external world. So I now have to have a me. So my left brain defines me, the ego, and it does that by a group of cells in the left parietal region that defines the boundaries of where I, me, begin and end. Well, the right brain knows I'm just atoms and molecules. I'm this living thing. I'm this ball of energy around this organic mass of some 50 trillion cells just exuding, overlapping with yours. You know, I'm up in Indiana. You're down in Florida. Everybody's wherever they are. We're all just one big energy ball. And then the left brain comes in and says, says, well, no, the, we, I have to be an individual. I have to. So this is where I begin and end. And then you're separate from me, right? Because you're a different person and you know your boundaries. And then I have language. And a part of language is, is me. I am an individual. I am Jill Bolte Taylor. And here's where I live. And here's my phone number. And here's what I like. And here's the, my favorite colors and blah, blah, blah. And it's all about me. So the left brain brings in all the energy of the present moment and says, yes, but I'm going to refer all of that through the filter of Jill Bolte Taylor because I'm the center of the universe. In my own mind, you're the center of the universe in your own mind. But in our right brains, we all know, mm, no, that's kind of like a temporary thing, but we'll work with you. So, so then in the left brain, as me, the individual, one of the things that the, the amygdala does in that left hemisphere is it says, okay, I'm going to bring in all the information of the present moment. I'm going to run it through the amygdala of the left. And the left is going to immediately jump out of the consciousness of the present moment. And it's going to jump into the past and say, hey, is there anything about this present moment that I have experienced in my past that I should push it away and say no in order to protect myself because it's a threat? Okay, all of a sudden now the left brain's in a completely different level of consciousness of some other time other than the present moment experience. And so we exist as human beings with these two hemispheres, one which is connected to all that is in the absence of me, the individual present moment. And then the left one, which is all about me, it gives has linearity of time, it has language, it has boundaries. And that left thinking tissue is all about connecting me in a rational information processing way with the external world. So we end up with two emotions emotional groups of cells, one in the present, one in the linearity of Jill Bolte Taylor, and then these two thinking modules of cells, which really distinguishes us as humans, one in the present moment, big as the universe connected to all that is blissful euphoria. Oh my gosh, who doesn't want to be there, right? And then the left thinking tissue, which is the neocortex of Jill Bolte Taylor in relationship to the external world. I mean, the brain is this magnificent collection of cells and this so in my thinking, it's how do we differentiate what's actually going on inside of our brains? What does it feel like to be in these different parts, these modules of cells? And what, what are their subsets? What are their skill sets? What are their personalities? And then we have the power to choose moment by moment who and how we want to be in the world. And oh my gosh, if that's not personal freedom, I don't know what is. Well, you know, it, and, and it makes sense because, you know, I've had... Um... Gary Chapman talk about the five love languages. We 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 know about Carl Jung and the four parts of yourself or the and there are so many different ways that it's been explained. And right. what I find from what you've done in your research and explaining it in a different way, because not everybody understands what one person says. That's why I have so many different right. teachers in the classroom because you right. may say the same thing that. I said, exactly. but now they get it because you said it. And so exactly. that's, that's how the brain, I'm fascinated by the brain. And yeah. so I, I'm so grateful that your experience. So you talk about four different um, characters in the brain. And I would love for you to, you know, explain character one through four and right. how they affiliate, how they associate and why we do the things we do. 
And yeah. maybe people can identify, ooh, I'm character one, I'm character two, that's right. my dominance. So right. can you share a little bit about those characters in the brain? Absolutely. Right? So, and it really, it all goes right back to the brain. And I love that you brought up Carl Jung. Carl Jung talks about the four archetypes. Yes. And it turns out, why, why are there four archetypes? There are four archetypes because across time and across examination, we have, we have, we have observed that there are four different ways of being in the world. Mm -hmm. And for his language, it's the four archetypes. Yes. For my language, it's four different modules of cells. So imagine taking Carl Jung's four archetypes and sticking them on top of groups of cells, very specific cells inside of the brain that we all have. And that's mm -hmm. why there are four archetypes. Mm -hmm. but, e but in his language, the, the archetype of the ego, the left thinking tissue. So in my language, I'm going to say we have two emotional modules of cells, a right, right emotion and a left emotion. And then we also have thinking modules of cells, right thinking and left thinking. And these are obvious groups of cells inside of the brain. The emotional ones are the alarm, alarm, alert, alert. One is going to be as it relates to me in my past and one's going to be the experiential of the present moment that I just talked about. So as we're thinking about Carl Jung's four archetypes in his language, only one character is conscious. And then we have these three unconscious parts of our brain. And in whole brain living, I just say to you, you know, I lost the conscious part of my character one. I gained an awareness of character two because I lost that, that left emotion. But I lived for eight years in the consciousness of character three, the emotion of the present moment and the thinking of the present moment. So these, so whole brain living essentially brings all four archetypes into conscious awareness so that now it's like, oh, well, I don't have to wonder when am I in my shadow? or when am I in my anima? When am I in myself? Because there are four characters that I can learn that I'm already embodying. Mm -hmm. Because we're bouncing in and out all these characters all day because that's what the brain does. All parts are always active, boom, boom, boom. But they take turns and I can identify. Okay, so character one. I call character one left brain thinking. So if I took a human brain, and many of you can see me, so I'm just going to use a little model here. If I have this brain like this, right hemisphere, left hemisphere, and I open it up like so, the left thinking tissue becomes character number one. The left emotional tissue becomes character number two. The right emotion becomes character three. And the right thinking becomes character four. These are actual groups of cells inside of our brain, right? So that makes it nice. Character number one, left thinking. This is the rational part of our brain. This is the part of our brain that has the ego. I, I am Jill Bolte Taylor. Everything goes in through the filter of me, Jill Bolte Taylor in relation to the external world. This is the part of me that can, can like, it likes to control everything. It likes to control people in the external world. It likes to fix things. It likes to control people. Uh, it likes to control places. Uh, it's going to put my stapler where the stapler belongs because <laughs> it wants to know where that detail is so that it can always use it, right? And yeah. it's a stickler about that. And it cares that you know that it cares about where its stickler is. So the character one is kind of the controller and the boss. Uh, it also controls uh, people, places, and, and then things. So um, it's details, details, more details about details. It organizes and defines what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is bad. Um, it knows where I put my glasses. It knows when uh, that I, I need to keep my glasses clean if I'm on a podcast, those kinds of details, right? <laughs> it, it, it manipulates time so that I can actually work my schedule and I can get here on time. So we all know that part of ourselves. It's our A-type personality. Hopefully it's got, you know, keeps order in the house. Um, the, and I'm guessing Lily, you know, your character one. I, I do have a bit of that. Yes, I do have a bit of that. <laughs> I, I do. I, I, I have a lot of character four too. And yeah. um, I think I've got a little bit of all. But exactly. Yes, you have Anatomically, to be, yeah, you, you have, have be, all four. Yeah. But I love the fact that that's where we develop our sense of right, wrong. Uh, and we know now where it comes from. You know, that's right. That left side Judgment. of the brain. Yes. yes. Judgment. 
Now, I encourage people because these are four very distinct identities inside of ourselves. And I encourage people to name these characters because that way then I can say that character, her name is Helen. And for me, I call my character one Helen. It's hell on wheels. She gets it done, right? (laughs) Where does she show up? She shows up in the office. She shows up on the computer. She shows up on the phone. She holds my body a certain way. She has a certain voice. She's the only one who's going to put really my glasses on or my earrings in, right? I mean, she, (laughs) she does it. She keeps the brain nearby, right? So character one, for me, it's Helen. It's a character. It's a personality. My friends call me on the phone. They can tell, oh, hi, Helen. I say, (laughs) I say, hello. And they say, oh, hello, Helen. And I say, what can I do for you, right? That's Helen. (laughs) Helen's busy, right? She's running her to-do list. And they're going, oh, Lord. Okay, Helen, um, could you like have somebody call me back later today? And it's like, I'll put it on my list, right? Because that's what (laughs) Helen does. She runs the to-do list. So that's Helen. So that's the left emotional group of cells. That's what they're programmed to do. Get to know your character one. Character two is the emotion of me, the individual, Jill Bolte Taylor. It's all about my pain of the past. It's all about my fears of the future. So it's also a group of cells deep inside of here, as I tear this apart right here, called the insular cortex of the, the of character two. And that's where craving happens. So our addictions are a part of character number two. Mm-hmm. And character number two is very real and alive in all of us. The pain of the past. Now, I personally, it's important to recognize your pain, process your pain, reflect on your pain, learn from your pain and move through your pain. And pain exactly. of the past, pain of the past, we visit it, we don't make it a lifestyle. Some people get all caught up in the character two pain of the past, and that becomes their lifestyle. And they're in pain all the time, forgetting that they have these other characters, these other parts of the brain. And the energy ball that goes into that, I'm angry, I'm in my fear, I'm anxiety, I'm craving, I'm in my addiction, whatever it is, I want this, I hate you. All that is powerful. And it's powerful because it's a mighty group of cells designed to save our life. So this is a lovely, tender little part of ourselves that we need to say thank you. Yeah, I I wanna I wanna say something about that because this is really important, you know, that you have isolated the the second character of our brain because if they live in character number two, that will eventually manifest into disease. And those are some of the things that we talk about in the classroom and I deal with in the workshop. I help people see that that pain can be their passion, just like your brother may have been your pain at one point in your life and it became your passion. And look at what you've been able to do with your life. There is blessing in everything. And so if we don't, if we ignore that part of the brain, it will lead to disease. It becomes a symptom. And then a doctor gives us a pill. That's right. Okay. That's right. Or we go into an addiction or mm-hmm. in order to not feel that pain, or no. we commit suicide. Mm. I mean, in order to end the pain, I mean, character two is a precious, precious, precious part of who we are specifically. And, and what I love about character two is this is the group of cells. This amygdala right here in the left hemisphere. This is the group of cells that was willing to step out of the blissful euphoria of the present moment in order to take that information and compare it to our entire past experience to see if this is a threat and we need to push away. This character is designed to save our life. Yes. At the same time, it can sabotage every relationship we have because then it's like, oh, well, that's scary, that's different. It likes what is familiar. It is attracted toward what is familiar, which can also be dangerous if my idea of a loving man in my life is an alcoholic who beats me because that's what daddy did to mommy, right? And so that's why we keep repeating these patterns. But that's why if we avoid going in and reflecting and learning from that, then it just gets clogged up and we, we get stuck in there as opposed to learning from the, the squealing animal that we really are when we move into that pain. We have to hear the pain. The pain is saying there's, there's tissue damage if it's in the body and if it's in the brain, it's still a pain that we 
we need to explore so that so that not that we squash it down and don't ever want to hear from it again, because we all know it's only going to erupt, right? It's like it gets caught in a pipe and the pipe's going to blow eventually. Mm -hmm. So we want the fluidity of the experience. Uh, I, I am the first person to say, go in and explore that pain, but learn and grow from the pain. Don't let it become a lifestyle. Beautifully said. Can't expand on that anymore. That is beautifully said. And I hope that you guys are listening to this and replay this to this moment, because this is crucial. It is meant to give us, um, save our lives. And it supported us when we were children, but it doesn't support us anymore as adults because it creates the misery we think we live in. So thank you so much for that incredible explanation for character two. What is the thank name you. of your character two? My character two is Abby. It's short for abandonment because I think as you know, when I was in the womb, I was in this mag, you know, I started out as a single cell and it's like, oh my God. And then I started multiplying at a rate of 250,000 new cells per second. And so I'm this energy ball inside of the womb of my mother, sharing her blood, sharing her lymphatics, sharing her immune system, listening to that beautiful heartbeat, being muted of all the senses while I'm in the womb and then bam, Pushed. right. <laughs> Welcome to the world. To me, that's the moment of my pain. That's when when I screamed, right? Wow. What do you do when you're born? You wail. <gasps> you're bringing oxygen and expanding your lungs and you're no longer in a fluid environment. Now you're, you're in a gaseous environment. You don't have any protection from the sound or from the lights or from peak bill poking and prodding and, you know, all that. Well, I tell you what, you went real back to the, you went to the original moment. That's awesome. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So let's continue on with character number three. So character number three, the, the right brain. Once again, the difference is I, the individual, I don't exist in the right here, right now. I'm connected to all that is. I have to have that left brain to define the boundaries of where I begin to have me as an individual. So the right brain characters three and four are as big as the universe. They are the energy ball of what is everywhere. And so, so it's communal. It likes to share with others and the emotional tissue coming in through that amygdala of the right here, right now is, you know, if a bus is coming at me in the present moment, I'm going to jump. Right. Yeah. So I do have that alarm, alarm, alert, alert, protect myself in the present moment. But also, mm, I like to have stimulation. I like exhilaration. What's it feel like to have the clothes on your body? What's it feel like to have your glasses and to have the temperature of the air? What's the experiential of the present moment? And so if I'm performing sculpture, I'm lost in time because time's a manufactured by that left brain and I'm lost in time and the deliciousness of what whatever the medium is that I'm playing in and I'm being creative because there's no right, wrong, good, bad defined by that left hemisphere. And I'm innovative and I'm interested and, and I'm loving and I'm empathic and I'm open because I'm connected and you're a part of me. So I feel what you feel because I'm a part of you. And I read that through your body language, language and your facial language and your, your intonation and all that. So that's character three. It's a very playful, creative, open, innovative, innovative, uh, uh, dynamic part of us. It's also the part of us that loves an adrenaline rush right here, right now. Come on, Lily. Let's go, let's go hide. Let's go uh, hang gliding or let's go do something fun, right? <laughs> let's go get in trouble, right? Uh, let's go do something impulsive right now that's going to land us in jail. Let's go have fun. <laughs> let's go have fun or let's go push the envelope. Yes. Right. A whole lot of character threes are landed in jail. So mm -hmm. it is true that this is our playful, creative, innovative, but we also have to temper it with that other hemisphere Correct. because otherwise it just runs wild. Yes. Right. And wild okay. is fun up to a certain point. And then society says, I'm sorry, Jill, running naked on the beaches in Florida. <laughs> it's not OK. <laughs> Lily, why did you let her do that? And it's like now she's in jail and all over the news. Right. So, um, so, so and I shift, shift into character number two. It's her exactly, <laughs> it's exactly her three went wild. What can I say? So that's character three. I call my character three pig pen, you know, the Charles Schultz, uh, cartoon, um, uh, peanuts, yes. right. 
Pig pen is always in a dust of storm. The storm is in the present and in the present is made up from the dust of 2000 years ago, Babylonia, you know, I mean, wherever, (laughs) who knows what's in my dust storm, but I'm open to the present experience. And the first step of the creative process is chaos. So it's a mess. Right. Yes. So pig pen's a mess. So I, if I go to the art space, uh, I know it's going to be a mess and I'm good with that. And Helen over here goes, you go play pig pen. And then when you're done, uh, let, you know, give me 10 minutes, put, put 10 to 15 minutes in so I can like clean up the mess before we go upstairs to dinner. <laughs> Right. So, uh, so the, it's really then becomes how do these, these characters inside of our own head negotiate their relationships. So character number four is the neocortex of that character of that right hemisphere. And this is the part of us that just is big as the universe is connected to all that is, is filled with intense and constant gratitude. Oh my gosh. I'm alive, just period. I'm alive. I'm this organic, amazing thing. Not just a microbe. I'm not a little bacterium. I'm not just a virus with a little bit of RNA or DNA. I am 50 trillion beautiful molecular geniuses differentiated and refined in their ability. So I can see things through visual cells. I can speak through language tissue. I have legs that allow me to move myself in space. Oh my gosh, all inspired. Oh my land. Talk about the wonder of existence. That's all character (laughs) four is. She's just this magnificent connection to the consciousness of the universe, which is also the consciousness of every cell in our body. It's amazing. So if I want to bring health, forget that little stress circuitry of characters one and the pain of character two, Move into the open, awe and expansive glory of, oh my gosh, I'm a lot <laughs> yes. of And I'm a lot of every moment I have. Yeah, right? So that's character four. I call my character four queen because she's queen of the universe, right? We all are. <laughs> queen, toad. Toad because I love water. I live on a boat. I live on the water. That's my lily pad. Mm-hmm. I love my life on the water. So I'm queen. I call mine queen toad. Now and you I'm have another the- lily pad, me. There you go. And then you're the <laughs> lily pad. You absolutely are. I mean, I mean, these are the four parts of who we are. And if you look at Carl Jung, character one is going to be the ego. ego. Character mm-hmm. two is going to be the shadow. Uh-huh. Character three, it's right here right now. It isn't of me, the individual. So it's the androgynous anima animus both the male and the female characteristics. And then character four is what we call what they call the true self. Okay. Okay. Boom, so be, there you be, have it. It's amazing. So before we go into doing this brain huddle and yeah. finding out how do we integrate ourselves and not just live in, in character one or character four, or right. maybe even character three and end up in yeah. jail. And so I hope I got that right. And <laughs> yeah, uh, so, you did. Yeah, we got, did I get it wrong? <laughs> no, you got it right. Oh, I got it right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, character um, three is fantastic, but there are a lot of threes in jail. Yes, that's, that's right. And, yeah. and character two, you know, there's a lot of victims and victimization. Oh. And does the victimization triggers Pain. those same um, hormones that give you that love feeling, the you know dopamine and all that. So there's there's just so many things that we can benefit from each character. But before yeah. we go into how to integrate all this, right. I want to start leading you back to the when you need a friend.com because this is you know what Dr. Jill is talking about with whole brain living. I call 100% responsibility. And this is where I've become passionate in my life about this mission, which is, you know, taking ownership. Responsibility is not just about blame, shame, fault, and duty. That's what number two, character number two, we want to live in that four and that one where we can blend it together and, and it become ownership. And so if you want to learn more about that, go to whenyouneedafriend.com. Please subscribe while you're there. And while you're there, also like and follow me on all my social media, including BitChute and Odyssey, which I'm trying to help that one grow. Because of censorship, I want to be in a place where we can say whatever we want to say without being censored. So please do that. 
and check out Dr. Jennifer Grammuth. We just started yesterday. We started our first meeting for our gallbladder liver cleanse that we're doing, but I'm going to call it love your body cleanse because your liver helps you deal with every aspect of your body. So love your body. And the, the cleanse starts on Thursday. So you still have time if you want to be a part of that. Um, and so Dr. Jennifer Grammuth is going to guide us through the whole process. Also check out, um, uh, um, oh gosh, uh, this, the pharmacy in Merritt Island, uh, where you can get 20% off anytime you go there and say that you heard it for your first order uh, on Lillian McDermott radio show. And you can go to my affiliate bag where you can help. This is all to help grow the classroom because we are donor or, or enrolled student um, functioning by, by your generosity. So with the affiliates, then if you purchase something through there, I, the classroom gets a, a percentage, whether it's organic beauty products, health insurance, uh, fitness, alternative ways to manage pain, or depression, how to build your body. Uh, those are different products that you can find there. And finally, you can become an enrolled student in the classroom. You can donate a dollar or a thousand dollars a month, whatever you can do to help the classroom grow. Your time, your talent, your treasure will be greatly appreciated because now I don't do sponsors. So I need for you guys to help grow the classroom. And also I wanna direct you to the books that Dr. Jill has behind you. If you go to my website and um, you click on her name for the blog that we sent out, we send out every Sunday, you just click on her name, it'll take you to Dr. Uh, Jill, Dr. Jill Taylor, Dot com. If you go to Jill Taylor, Dr. Jill Taylor com, or you can just click on there. And then if you click on the stroke of insight or whole grain, uh, whole grain, whole brain living, I'm thinking Perlmutter here. And so uh, whole uh, brain living, it'll take you to those books. You can purchase it there. Um, and so Dr. Jill, I am so grateful for just uh, helping us understand our brain and why we do it. So how do we integrate? Because there's a lot of people that I know right. that are just so doubtful or right. you know, so logical that there's no room for emotion right. or everything right. is dismissed because it doesn't fit the logic. How do you right. start bringing this together? You know, I, I, uh, that's why I love the anatomy and I love that you're helping people gain a level of responsibility. I call it cognitive and emotional accountability because it's like, oh my gosh, you know, I've got this going on inside of myself and I do have the ability to pay attention to, let's say, um, uh, you know, I come home and uh, you're there and you're in your character one and you're busy and I come home and I've done with my day and it's like, well, we had an appointment to go for a walk and I want to go play, right? And so my little character three is like, like coming in going, well, uh, you said we, we get to go play, I want to go play. And you go, you go, you say pig pen. <laughs> <laughs> Big man, I need 20 minutes of being a character one. You give me 20 minutes of being a character one, we can go be character threes the rest of the afternoon. Okay, that's language, that's communication. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you come home, you're your character one, and you say, um, I need uh, I need to be my character, I need to, to work for a while. And I'm going, but you said, but, 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 and so I move into my character two, and then you move into your character two, and it's like, rah, 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 rah. and so we end up with a spat with one another because the characters aren't communicating with one another, and you know the default is always to get ugly with one another. Imagine that, especially out in public now. Isn't that yeah, fascinating yeah, how that's yeah. going on? Yeah, so yeah. I'm so so I've created this technique. It's called the brain, B-R-A-I-N. That's the acronym, the brain huddle. And the brain huddle is bringing all four characters into the conversation. And at any moment in time, usually in the course of an hour, we've run through all four of our characters a little bit here or there, probably a dozen times. They're busy in there, right? And so um, any of the characters, I can call a brain huddle at any time. Any of my four characters can call a brain huddle. And I encourage you to do that purposely as a character one, three, or four, because really it's all about practice so that we know the power of the brain huddle when character two, when we're caught in the pain and the anger and the fear of hostility of character two, because that's really when we need to rescue ourselves with our other four characters in the brain huddle. Mm -hmm. So be our R-A-I-N, B, 
breath. Focus on your breath. Everything begins with breath for for all kinds of of yoga or any kind of of meditation. Why is that? The breath happens in the present moment. It's a train that's running from the moment we're born to to the moment we die. There we can bring our mind to the breath. As soon as we bring our mind to our breath, we can increase it. We can decrease it. We can change the frequency. We can mess with our breath in any way whatsoever. But we bring our mind into the present moment. B. R is to recognize which of the four characters actually called the brain huddle. Was I in my pain? Did I call it as a two or was I out in nature going, oh my God, I'm alive. Let's have a brain huddle, everybody. So I just cuddle y'all and love on you, right? (laughs) How exciting that there's four of us in here. Or character one might say, okay, I need a pause. Let's take a huddle. Everybody, are y'all there? And everybody comes in and it's like, okay, we're all together. And then we'd run the brain huddle or character three. It's like, I'm in the middle of my joy. And it's like, let's have a huddle, everybody. Right. (laughs) That's what it likes. It likes the huddle. So, so recognize who called the huddle. A, breath. B, bring to the present moment. R, recognize who called the huddle. A, appreciate that no matter who called the huddle, we're all four here. There's four of us in here right? Now we can observe and see where the energy came from and where the energy is going, but A, appreciate the fact that we're all, there's four of us. I is inquire in this moment, Do I want to be queen toad? Do I want to step into my four and have a sense of gratitude? Do I want to jump into my character one and fix something or organize something or go get some things done? Or do I really want to kind of commiserate with a friend and really like misery loves miserable company and let's go bemoan together? Or do I want to go be playful out in the woods? Come on, Lily, let's go play, right? Uh, And inquire, who do we want to have come out by choice? It's choice. This is a moment of power. I have all the choice in the world in this moment. And then N is I'm going to make a decision and inquire, and I'm going to navigate the next few moment after moment after moment. Okay, well, in this moment, it's like, okay, we got 20 minutes. Let's go play. And then, in the, you know, and then the moment it's like, ah, you know, I just stepped in a mud puddle. And so now I got to get clean before a podcast. So, hey, you know, Helen comes online and it's time for character one. So I navigate as I go. And this is pure personal freedom. Be B-R-A-I-N, B, breath, R, recognize who called the huddle, A, appreciate they're all four here, inquire, which one do we want next? And then N is navigate as we go. And this is like, wow, all of a sudden I'm whole brain living. And it's exciting because then I'm actually building my life on purpose. I think it's amazing that you were able, and again, I had said at the beginning that a stroke of insight should have been called stroke of genius because this is really a wonderful way for us to embrace our brain, embrace, embrace who we are and yeah. work with what our strengths and weaknesses are. You know, that, that is something that in our lifetime, you know, we, we tend to do the things that we're strong and we're good right. at, but the reality is we need to also, or we get to spend right. time also in the things that we are not so good at. And it's yeah. good to just call on all of it. And by the way, for those of you who are watching and you have any questions for Dr. Jill, you can put in a cue, ask your question, and we'll ask it during the um, teacher's pet corner. Uh, if, if you have a question, just please feel free to do so. Um, but so let's say somebody is like, oh, I, that's, you know, I I can't, you know, it doesn't make any sense. How am I going to stop? How am I going to make myself? Is it easier as you go by and continue to do this? How do you call your brain huddles? I mean, how, how did you get to that place where you said, you know, I need to incorporate all who I am, not just focus on the number two or number. Yeah. Go ahead. You know, we need to know what our choices are. Everybody says, couldn't you have made a better choice? And it's like, don't you think if I had a better choice, I would have made a better choice? I mean, really, all I could think of was, no, I'm going to go bite that person because they bit me. And it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, <laughs> if so, this is really differentiation. If I only think I have one blob at the end of my, uh, instead of two legs, I just have one blob of one leg, then I can't walk. I can't crawl because I can't move them independently. So my 
my brain has to look at that mass of tissue down there and say, oh, I have two legs and I can consciously choose to move each of those independent of one another. And then that opens up all new possibilities. And the same thing's going on inside of our brain by understanding and being able to differentiate between these different parts of ourselves. Then it's like, oh, I can actually recognize, you know, I went to that party and I went in as a, as a two, I was really scared, but then somebody came up and they were really playful and open. And, and it was like, and then I was playing Django before you knew it. And then I was laughing and then I was in my character three. And then I just kind of sat back and looked back and said, you know, I really do love these people. My life is so blessed to have these people in my environment. And then it's like, oh, and then somebody spilled some, uh, some wine and I jumped up in order to like, go be a character one and help clean it up. So, you know, we've got all of this simultaneously going on inside of our brain and whole brain living simply allows us to recognize these are three very, four very distinctive characters. And so that's why I wrote the book and the book will take you through character one and it will teach you all about the skill sets of those cells at a cellular level. And then what does it feel like when you're embodying your own character one? My character one feels completely different than my character three. My, I, you know, character three, I just become like, ah, oh, 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 and I'm bouncing all over and it's time to dance. And it's like, we do. And character one is going, really? Lily's going to make me dance. Um, <laughs> right. So, so, you know, they're all very different. And the better we differentiate, this is about maturing our own differentiation, refining our relationship with our own brain cells and our ability to create the world and life we want. This is, this is wonderful. Um, so you do recommend that each one of us spend time with each part of our brain, oh, and absolutely. look at it, love it and figure out how can, um, w- when I coach people, I always tell them, take the things that you're doing, your habits that you're doing and rewrite right next to it. How would you do that differently? How can you do this to, to really love yourself? How can, you know, how can you tame that, that thought that says you're a stupid idiot or whatever? How can you change that thought and rewrite the program? What do you recommend for someone who is totally, um, you know, a victim uh, and it hasn't named their, their victim character number two, what do you recommend for someone like that to shift out of it other than to call a brain huddle that they may not be able to call a brain huddle? I think that the most important thing that people can recognize is that we are biologically programmed at the level of our own brain to love ourselves. There is a part of our, our self, uh, the awe, the wonder that I have life at all. If I'm focusing on all the negative and all the details and all the things that, that make me sad, make me mad, make me less than, and if, I, if I'm focusing my mind on that group of cells, then that's the group of cells that's running. And the thing about brain cells is that the more time we spend running a circuit, the stronger that circuit becomes, and then it becomes uh, automatic and habitual thinking. So how do we create a habit? We start something, we think another way. And, and, you know, we have the ability when I move into my character too, there is a, a feeling of what it feels like to be that part of myself. Well, I know what I feel like when I'm not in my character too. Now, if my whole life is a character too, I'm going to encourage people to look at other solutions for true medical depression. Mm-hmm because that can root into that character to just routinize, routinize, routinize. There are a lot of behaviors that we can do. And, and, but, but if I've tried it all and I can't get out of it, then I do have to go and look at my biology. And I have to say, what is actually going on at a cellular level? And mental illness is real. I look at my brother's schizophrenia, his brain hallucinates and hears things. Here's the voice of Jesus 24 seven. This is nothing I can, I can do anything with because his cells are actually biologically programmed for that hallucination. Now, can we teach him about what is going on inside of his brain? Well, if he would let us teach him, yes, we could help him in that way, but he won't. It's not, he's, he's not wired with the capacity. So I do want to, first of all, distinguish mental illness is true and real and chronic depression. There are several different biological reasons for true depression, but this is really about how do I take my brain as a person who isn't going to be at that chronic 
uh, or acute severe depression or mental illness? How do I work with the cells inside of my brain in order to strengthen certain circuits that I know that I can in order to distract myself away from that pain? Or how do I focus on that pain with a part of myself, my character for that is loving and supportive? We are never alone. We have the perception in our character too that we are alone and isolated and lonely because there's a group of cells in there that defines me as separate from the whole. But I'm not separate from the whole. I only have that perception. But I then have that right brain ability to hook into the consciousness of my characters three and four where I can use those characters to self-soothe myself. And then there are tools that we can teach ourselves to self-soothe. And it's the same kind of thing. When my mother died, she was my self-soother. I didn't have that. I didn't, I had my own little character too. And I'd go to my mama and my mama would come in with her love and she would soothe me. And then once my mother passed away, it was like, well, I still had my character too, but now I didn't have my mama's character for her to come in. And it was like, well, what did she do? What did she say to me? How did she hold me? What was the support that she brought to me? And I learned I could train myself then to give that to myself and create this healthy relationship between my own character for and my character too. Well, I think this there's more to discuss. For those of you who are listening on podcasts, come watch the whole entire class with Dr. Jill Bolte Teller. This is so amazing. Ask your questions because I know you have them uh, so that we can continue this conversation in the teacher's pet corner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to learn more about the brain. And please remember, go to drjilltaylor.com to learn more and continue to grow. This is Lily McDermott and Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor wishing you love, peace, joy, and unexpected abundance. Make it the best day ever. The opinions and advice expressed on the Lillian McDermott radio show are intended for the individual callers and guests on the program and are presented to our wider audience solely for general educational purposes. Please act responsibly and consult personally with your own medical, psychological, or nutritional expert before taking any steps to improve your life. Okay, so we have some questions. Um, before I um, ask the question, that's the, the questions that are there. Uh, and all of you type in a cue, write your questions down, and then I'll read it. Let's talk about addiction because there was something very powerful, very powerful, when it comes to um, character number two with addictions yeah. um, and how important it is for that number two to show up to yeah. heal any addiction or any craving. Right. Would you like to elaborate on that? Do you want me to do that? We're ready. Right We're ready. Oh, We're ready. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. Okay. So um, addiction is um, a group of cells inside of the brain that says, um, I'm stimulated. I want something. There's something that I want. Crave, crave, crave. And then it hooks into this, whatever the, it is that we're addicted to, that then hooks into, uh, you know, the pleasure centers of our brain. And so the way that I look at addiction in that character too, and the pain, and how do we do that is um, I believe simply because we're alive, we are all on the hero's journey. And so the hero's journey is going to take those four archetypes of Carl Jung and put them by Joseph Campbell into this mythological storyline where the conscious mind is that character one. I am an individual and I am mighty and I am powerful and I'm in my world. And then I have my shadow self, my pain, which is that character two. And the hero's journey takes us out of the character one and the character two and says, I have a yearning to evolve my, the meaning in my life. Well, we gain true meaning by being in service to others. We have purpose and meaning when we reach that character four status. So during the hero's journey, the ultimate goal is for me to find meaning. And if I can find true meaning, then my addiction and the power of addiction can be lifted away from me because out of my biology, since it's just cells, my biology, especially after a small period of time, it's no longer a true addiction. Now I'm addicted at an intellectual character one, character two level. 
Mm. So the hero's journey is my willing to say, say, I'm an alcoholic, let's say. And my character two is the active alcoholic. And the character one is saying, well, I'd really like to have a drink. And, you know, after work, I could have a drink and I'm going to set myself up with my buddies so that I can have a drink. And that's just what we do. We have drinks. And then part of drinking is drinking. And then, you know, the drinking just becomes the obsession and the action in that left brain. And so, but I have the ability to say, you know, just simply because I'm having the thought that I want to engage in my addiction or I'm feeling the pain and pull of my addiction, it's just cells in energy running in loops. And so I can pause and bring my mind to the present moment. As soon as I do that, step one of the brain huddle, breath, as soon as I bring my mind to the present moment, I'm no longer fueling all the energy circuitry of the habitual thinking of the craving in my character two. Now I can keep thinking as a character one, I want to drink, I want to drink, I want to drink, or I can actually be in rehab and know I am an alcoholic and my character one would really like to think I want to drink, but I don't really want to drink because drinking has ruined my life. And so by bringing my breath to the present moment, I've automatically left out of the pain of the circuitry of the addiction into the present moment, into my character three and character four possibilities. So B brings me aware into the right hemisphere, but I've got a whole bunch of monsters. I've got a battle along this hero's journey and the battling and the monsters are, I, I want it, I want it, I have to have it, I have to have it. Oh my God, I'm gonna die without it. And all my friends, oh my God, you know, I can't have my friend circle anymore because they're all alcoholics too and it, they're lives are ruined too and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, all these monsters that are preventing me from experiencing the present moment. But once I battle, I mon battle my monsters and they're never all going to go away. There's always a new monster to pop up. And we just have to recognize that when I'm in an addiction, I'm always addicted. It takes no time at all for my brain pattern to re-say, oh yeah, drink. Oh yeah. Oh, that was a bad idea. But now I'm back into it and I'm an alcoholic for the next three years again, right? Until I go back into rehab. So, and then I go through all this destruction. So in the hero's journey, it's getting, it's looking at and recognizing these are cells and circuit. This is, this is passionate. This is real. People say to me, but my pain is real. And I say, absolutely. Your pain is real. How much time do you want to run that circuitry? right? Because your joy and your, 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 your bliss is also real. So we have some choices. So once we battle our monsters and we get into the consciousness of the characters three and the four, then the ultimate goal is to find that peace. Peace is at the, at the end of the road of the hero's journey, but we don't go there and we live there because we're completely non-functional if we're all just bliss and peace, right? I have to come back into my left brain, but my left brain is where my pain and my addiction is. So how do I hold my peace and my euphoria of my relationship with the universe? Call it whatever my God is. If you're in re AA rehabilitation, the God of your own making, it can be the doorknob, right? It can be nature. Nature. It can be church. I don't care what it is, but whatever that that is for you, where you go and you find that connection to being that whole part of yourself, strengthen that circuitry, spend more time running that circuitry. And then you'll find that the other circuitry will begin to dissipate because now you're creating new habits. Mm -hmm. And then we have to go back from, because ultimately, yeah, I can stay in my peaceful euphoria, which is what happened with my stroke. My stroke was nothing more than a hero's journey, right? I had this, this phenomenon. I go into character four. I'm now in character four. I'm saying, I really like this, but it's completely non-functional. So I can either bliss out and be a ve vegetative the rest of my life, or I can try to battle my way back ability by ability of by ability, rebuild my character to rebuild my character one, come back as an individual and bring the lessons I have learned from my own journey and share that with others. And that's what the hero's journey is. And we're all just spattered on that journey throughout moment by moment by moment. At any moment in time, you can say, well, where are you in your hero's journey? Where do you yeah. want to be? Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that makes sense. And when it comes to, um, you talked about depression and mental illness, and I have a personal opinion, and I know it's just an opinion that I believe people don't know how to be sad anymore. 
Yeah. Um, sadness is now depression. And to me, you know, everybody gets sad, but you, you realize, okay, well, there was a, there was a purpose for this. I've learned from it. This is just like the step that you're talking about. Yeah. But now people are like, they're not wanting to deal with their emotions. They're going to psychiatrists who don't need to measure what's wrong. And they just prescribe. And some of these medications cause more harm. How does someone know this isn't sadness or this is chemical, or is there such a thing as chemical? And maybe it's a nutritional deficiency as opposed to a chemical deficiency. What would you have to say uh, about that? Yeah, this is a, this is a huge conversation because there are so many different uh, problems that can result in the experience of depression. You're absolutely correct that in our society, we're in the take a pill society. No question about that. We're even take a pill to the kids. Uh, they're bouncing off the walls instead of letting them exercise or really burn themselves out. We're sticking their right, right character three, uh, which is natural at that age to play and burn out all that energy, right? And then we're giving them sugar, you know, for in donuts and and cereal in the morning. So of course they got to bounce around. And then we're we're saying, well, now they can't focus, and so now we're going to give them a pill in order to to have them focus or whatever. So um, we do exist in a society that is based on the values of the left brain that says character one, I want to create order in the world. And these children or these people are not being cooperative. And so we're going to give them a pill in order to control them. Right. So yes, under some circumstances, under many circumstances, we're in a society that, that, that doesn't value pain. We don't value pain. We see it as something that's horrible. We need to get rid of it. No, pain, whether it's an emotional, a spiritual, or a physical pain is a alarm bell ringing saying, pay attention to me. There's something here you need to look at. Well, I don't want to look at my pain. I don't want to feel my sadness. I don't want to feel my grief. I don't want to feel, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to. And it's like, mm, well, but but what you're doing is you're stopping up that pipe and building it up so it's going to explode. And then we're going to give you a pill that says, okay, well, then you have a higher threshold of, of, of holding it in. But you still, we, we need to look at ourselves as these magnificent biological creatures and sadness and grief and hurt and, and these, what we would frame as negative emotions are a part of being alive. And there's messaging in there. Now, that's a, a huge part of the population. I won't don deny that. However, we are cells and we are cells in circuit. And a lot of depression, severe chronic depression, is a complete sense of emptiness. And uh, there are groups of cells inside of the right brain that bring us that connection to all that is. And there's joy and there's a meaning. And with a clinical depression, so those cells may go to sleep. And if those cells go to sleep, then we can't find any joy and there's no meaning and there's no sense of reason, no sense of, of purpose in life. And that is a true clinical chronic depression. So uh, we're on a big subject here. Uh, and I will say, yes, it's important to examine it, but, but, and, and that's why I encourage people to explore ways of opening up and exploring what is the pain that I'm feeling? Why am I feeling it? And are there therapeutic ways that are, are that I can, I can get out of that part of my circuitry into other parts of me? Um, and yet, there's still going to be a small population of us that actually will benefit from medications because what medications are going to do is they're going to change the, at the cellular level, the level of communication of which cells are communicating with which cells, with which chemicals and what quantities of those chemicals for what period of time. And so, you know, it's all of it. You know, and, and when you say that, I, I, I don't think I've shared this with you yet, but my registered service mark is you can take a pill or you can take responsibility. And it's not that I'm against the pill. I am, I'm against, right. I'm for doing things that will help you explore where's the pain? Why is it, where's the discomfort? What, what is really truly right. going on? How can I use this for the greater good? But as I'm listening to you speak, to lose character four in your life right there that to me um if i if i were to name my character four it would be grace yes 
that that would be gratitude. Um, yes. And uh, to me, I call it gratitude is the kryptonite of depression. And uh, to me, that's yes. that's that's just my opinion. But I yes. heard you say the minority of people would benefit from yes. medication. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you still have to go to the cells and say what's actually going on in the cells and yeah. cells. Uh, in different people are wired together differently and uniquely. And so I think that that it is a, a fine line between, I mean, someone like my brother, he, no matter what, how much grace he could bring into his psychosis, he has psychosis. Uh, he hallucinates. He has delusional system. Uh, he is so miswired from normal reality that there's just, he's in that bubble of normality. He's like, he's gone, you know, and uh, medications cannot wire him back. I mean, I mean, think about it. Look at it this way. This is, this is a good example. When I was at Harvard, I studied the visual system and, um, uh, and I did that because people with, and I'm going to go to schizophrenia because it's, it's, it's dear to your heart. It's yeah. And, but it's still a wiring issue. So people with schizophrenia often will have a, a normal person. If I'm watching a normal uh, target move through space, the normal brain will jump in front and then jump on, jump in front, jump on, jump in front, jump on. So I'm actually focused on the detail and where it's going. The brain, many of something like 80 per 86 percent of people with schizophrenia have what we call a, a wave jerk. So they will jump in front and then behind and in front and in behind, which means their eyes, their visual brain system, which is a third of what's going on inside of the head, is never focusing on the target that the rest of the normal community are. Mm-hmm. How on earth do you take all that raw data that is missed and create a hit? You cannot do it. Right. And then there are other issues with sensory systems. People with with um, uh, schizophrenia, their level, their tolerance of pain is really, really high. So so we might respond down here. Pain, pain. I got to respond. I got to I'm going to have a heart attack. Well, a lot of people with severe mental illness will have a heart attacks because they're not feeling any of that pain until it's the big one. Right. Mm. So their sensory perception of the world is building for them a world that is different, skewed away from what any else, what the rest of us would refer to as normal. So it is true. Mental illnesses, brain or brain diseases, brain illness is a, a different wiring. And if you are wired different to some degree, yes, we can help you wire yourself back. But you've got to be wired enough to normal that you want to do that. Mm, very good point. Very good. Yeah. Okay. So I have another question. Why do they say it's chemical imbalance, but there's no test to measure? That's a big question. So, so let's say then I'm going to go back to which cells are communicating with which cells, with which chemicals and in what quantities of those chemicals. Mm -hmm. So there is a system, there's a dopamine system, cells that communicate with dopamine, cells that communicate with serotonin as the chemical, the neurotransmitter. And so we know that if we often with depression, there is a decrease of the impact of the serotonin system. And, and so we can influence that serotonin system in several ways. We can encourage those cells to create more serotonin um, or by taking something like 5-HTP, which then may turn into uh, 5-HT, which is serotonin. And so we're increasing the volume, the amount of serotonin. Or if you're a cell and I'm a cell and I send out serotonin and you have little receptors and um, we can then give a uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitor, meaning that that serotonin between us is going to stay out there longer instead of being reabsorbed back by me, or I'm sending serotonin to you and you have those receptors. And then uh, we can give a, a serotonin uh, uh, um, amplifier, which will have the serotonin stay on the receptors longer so that ultimately we are influencing the overall impact of serotonin in the serotonergic system of the brain. So it's, it's detail. I mean, it, 
it's complex. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and, but you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that there's no test. And so you, you go on, on, uh, it's the only profession that doesn't have to test in order to well, prescribe. No, well, that's not totally true. If you oh, go yeah. in and yeah, if you go in and you do a urinalysis, okay. the okay. urine is going to, if you, whatever you've got inside of your nervous system, if you've got your, if you have an excess of it, you're still going to spill out some over into the urine. So okay. you'd be able to look at the urine and say, okay, in a norm, normal person, how much mm. serotonin spillover is there? How much dopamine spillover is there? And there are people who do these tests in order to determine. What's the test called? Is, is I there... don't even know. Okay. I well, all... now we can ask for it by description. Exactly. Somebody does these. There are several labs that will actually do these analyses, but if you don't know, so if you don't know what is normal for that person, but okay, let's say say I'm feeling really bad, uh, I, I'm 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 and I want to have this test, and it shows that I just don't have any serotonin showing up in my urine, and maybe normally I should have at least some of the the metabolic uh, breakdown pieces of that. Mm -hmm. Then it's like okay, well we can actually look. But, but that's all outside of the central nervous system. You know, it's not like we're going to go in there and we're going to uh, stick a needle and puncture the, do a, a spinal puncture and analyze what all of the chemistry in there, because, whoa, the last thing you want to do is that. Um, but it would give you information. But if we don't have a baseline for what was normal for that person, it makes it more difficult to know, well, is this person skewed from their normal or not? Um, but there are ways to, and so, so the easiest way, which is why we go to behavior is mm -hmm. that the, the dopamine system is our pleasure system. It's our reward system. If we're not feeling a lot of pleasure or reward, or it's taking more of my drug of choice to give me the same pleasure that I had before, then you know, biologically that the influence of what that drug has done to the dopamine system is those receptors now kind of pull themselves back because you're overwhelmed well mean with your drug, that cell and that cells a living being that's trying to save its life. Mm -hmm. So you can go and look at the behaviors. And from that, that's why we can go neuropsychologically what is going on, because that's the output of the system. Very good. Very good. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. So, you know, I, I want to encourage all of you that are watching today, listening uh, in today or in the future uh, to get the book whole brain living and figure out what the names of your characters are. I think if I were to give mine, it would be um, Victoria because I, we are always trying to go for the victory. Like I, I love getting things off my list. We you know when I know I have lots of deadlines, I'd love getting, so that's victory, uh, Victoria. Yep. Um, then for number two, I would say Izzy, because I would, I think that my, my initial years was the, the abandonment. To me, it was like insignificance. Uh -huh. I was one of many kids. And uh -huh. so Izzy maybe sounds a yeah. little bit more like insignificant. Yeah. And uh, I felt insignificant most of my life. And yeah. then for number three, it would be Addie. Because I do like to 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 add, include, and and have that um, exactly. also be. I love to the joy of doing things and action and all of that. And then last would be Grace, my character number four, being grateful Beautiful. and and having gratitude. So I want to encourage all of you share your four characters with me. Uh, get the book journal about yourself, get to know you on, uh, on, no, on January 15th, 16th, and 17th, the I am the solution, the I am is God in us, the I am solution, um, the solution is the acronym, I am an acronym queen, so when I saw your acronym for brain, I thought, oh, love this woman, uh, I love acronyms, because it helps me get yeah. things organized, get things done, and yeah. so I want to encourage all of you to dive into your life, dive into, listen yeah. to what Dr. Jill Bolte Teller is telling you because she lived it, yeah. you know, and now you get to live it too, without having to experience everything she had to go through. Yeah. I, I just want to ask one last question. Yeah. Do you feel that you were able to thrive the way you do because you were num a character number four for such a long time, you were limitless and there was lots of possibility. Do you, do you, th what do you attribute your will to, 
to get to the place where you're at today? Well, I, yeah, I think it was, you know, as character four was there, wow, great, awe, wonder, I'm alive, but I'm alive and I don't have a left brain now. So I'm, you know, I'm going to exist for eternity in this blissful euphoria, but I'm alive. What can I do with my life? And doing something with my life meant trying, trying to connect one more neuron to another neuron to give me another ability. I had no guarantee I was going to get anything back, but look at it. Look at what happened. And you are helping so many people now. And uh, you had shared that this is going to be something that's going to be adopted by the prisons. And um... it's amazing. It's amazing where it's going. Not for profits are coming to me. If any of you are affiliated with a not for profit and you'd want to bring whole brain living into your network, just, just contact Dr. Jill at drjilltaylor.com. Very nice. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. I hope all of you are encouraged to learn a little bit more about the characters. You know, multiple multiple personality disorder, you know, is, is something that's got a really bad reputation, but we can rename it. That's, we can kind that's, of no, that's very different because those characters, those characters don't know are each other. generally hidden from one another and have been traumatically broken apart. This is just our normal. No, I, I was just being yeah. like playing on that, that we have these characters within us, all of us, but we yes. can become a team as opposed yeah. to working against one another. So Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor, thank you so much for gracing us with your wisdom and empowering us with some new tools to become better for ourselves. So I'm gonna say goodbye to all of you on uh, Facebook